Thank you, Susanna. I think that's the nicest introduction I've had for a while. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for all staying till the end. I'm going to be talking to you today about a very exciting area of development, food immunotherapy and the future, and what this means for our patients. So, I just wanted to get a show of hands. Are any of you performing immunotherapy to unheated cow's milk, egg or peanut in your patients currently? So that's a resounding no. Most of the t oh, hello, there's one patient. Where are you from? Um. The baked egg and baked milk, yes. So quite a few people do that. But to unheated egg and unheated milk, do you do that? No. So there's only a few centres in the UK that are doing that. Um, so Leicester and um, Birmingham are some centres that are doing uh, egg and milk desensitisation. Cambridge is doing peanut desensitisation. And then there are many centres that are doing this as part of a research project. So we're doing peanut desensitisation as part of uh, research. So I'm just going to briefly go through the methodology terminology. Then I'm going to talk about the main foods that are um, used for immunotherapy, uh, cow's milk, egg and peanut, and then I'm going to briefly touch on multiple allergen immunotherapy because, as you know, when you see patients in clinic, they're not just allergic to one food, generally they're allergic to multiple foods. Must talk about the adverse events and safety considerations of immunotherapy, quality of life. So methodology, there's very different ways that we can administer immunotherapy. Uh, subcutaneous, which um, was done uh, many years ago, uh, and there were some fatalities to foods, therefore that has uh, not been uh, restarted again, although there are some phase one studies now starting in Europe for subcutaneous immunotherapy to peanut using viral vectors. Oral immunotherapy is what I'm going to focus my talk on mostly because it's the most efficacious uh, method of immunotherapy. Sublingual immunotherapy is safer but less efficacious. Epicutaneous immunotherapy is also safer and um, also less uh, uh, efficacious than oral immunotherapy. So the way that you can administer food uh, immunotherapy is you can do it in a, the rush period, which is over days, and certain studies have done that, usually in hospital. You can have updosing over several weeks where the first um, doses are done in hospital, and then they can either be done at home or in hospital for their updosing. And then the maintenance dosing is what people remain on generally for life because we know that even if you do immunotherapy, you're not cured of your food allergy. You need to continue to take the food on a regular basis. So these are the mechanisms of oral immunotherapy. Essentially, what happens is that you increase your regulatory uh, pathways within your immune system, and you have a reduction in the IgE um, sensitivity of your food allergy. What this means for the patient is that um, immunotherapy causes a state of desensitization, which is a reversible state because your effector cells, your B cells and your T cells are less reactive. And also it means that you can have more of the food without actually e having a, an allergic clinical reaction. But once you stop the immunotherapy, you generally go back to having allergic reactions. You may have a slight increase in the threshold of reactivity even after stopping the immunotherapy, but you will not be cured in the most part. So tolerance or sustained unresponsiveness is what we want to achieve. So this is what we would really like to be able to achieve with immunotherapy, but we're just not there yet. This would be where the patient can eat as much of the allergen as they want. They can start and stop eating the allergen um, as many times as, as they like to, and they don't need to continue to take that food on a regular basis. Now, it's interesting because um, I think tolerance or sustained unresponsiveness is what matters perhaps to the doctors, but to the patients actually, having spoken to more and more patients, they don't seem to be as bothered about curing their allergy. What they want is to prevent themselves from having that acute, severe allergic reaction that causes them to you know, have life-threatening symptoms and potentially die. Uh, it is that which reduces their quality of life. It's that risk that um, if it's their child that they, that one time they weren't looking, that child picked up a piece of peanut from the table and then their child dies. It's having that sort of um, 
safety net for accidental exposures. So the way I think about immunotherapy has also changed based on what patients have been telling me. So talking about cow's milk, this is a nice study even though it's quite old. So they picked children that I really think are the ones that would benefit from cow's milk immunotherapy. They picked children that had not grown out of their milk uh, allergy by the time they were five. They had a history of severe reaction with high to uh, specific IgEs and reacting at a very, very low dose. So these are the patients who might react just walking into Costa Coffee because of aerosolized milk. So as you can imagine, would really uh, deteriorate their quality of life. So in this study, they did a, a randomized controlled trial where they randomized some children to a cow's milk avoidance, and then they randomized some to a very slow increase in cow's milk. So they had 10 days in, as an inpatient, and they built up a, a small amount of cow's milk to an amino acid and built up this very, very gradually, and then did some further increments at home. And after a year of being on the maintenance therapy, those that could achieve the top dose, 36% tolerated 150 mils or above. And generally, when it comes to cow's milk desensitization, you need to tolerate between 150 and 200 mils to say that you are tolerant fully, that it's been fully effective. Then there were partial, partially tolerant individuals who tolerated between 5 and 150 mils, and there were 10, which is the general finding in immunotherapy that 10% of people don't manage it because of predominantly abdominal symptoms and sometimes also respiratory symptoms. So after a year, um, generally all the ones that were allergic and were avoiding were unable to tolerate cow's milk. And of those that had managed to get some way through the desensitization process, so basically 90% were able to tolerate some form of cow's milk. So that is a benefit for the 90% of patients that got there. So most of them did experience adverse events, and this is something else that people talk about a lot with food immunotherapy. If you have somebody who's had three years of being allergic to cow's milk and egg and peanut, and they haven't had a single allergic reaction, if they start having desensitization or immunotherapy, they're going to have multiple allergic reactions, whereas before they had none. So is this something that they really want to be embarking on? So it's something to obviously consider that they will be having lots of allergic reactions, whereas maybe beforehand with avoiding, they didn't have any allergic reactions. So in this group, two had an adrenaline requirement in their rush phase, and then one required adrenaline at home, and that's what we really worry about. We, we don't like people having adrenaline in hospital, but at least they're in a safe environment. What we worry about is them having anaphylaxis at home whilst on immunotherapy, and for whatever reason, it's not managed appropriately, and then there's a bad outcome. So these are the, the aspects that we, we, do, we, we would be worrying about and are worried about in research projects. So the control group did experience mild accidental reactions, but in comparison, all of the intervention group did. So did these children who underwent desensitization to cow's milk achieve oral tolerance? This is another study that looked at this question, and they took milk allergic children who first underwent sublingual immunotherapy to cow's milk, because there is some evidence that that uh, increases the safety of oral immunotherapy if you do sublingual immunotherapy first. Then there were a few that carried on with just sublingual immunotherapy, and you can see that generally it wasn't very effective, even um, at the desensitization, and um, after uh, withholding for six weeks, actually none of them could tolerate cow's milk. If they went on to the, the goal dose of two milligrams, which was the higher dose of cow's milk, then 80% could tolerate uh, cow's milk at, uh, at the maintenance phase, and after six weeks off, that reduced down to uh, five out of 10. So, uh, so there was a reasonable uh, sustained unresponsiveness rate. At the lower dose of one milligram, they had uh, only 60% tolerating this on the maintenance dose, and then that dropped down to three out of 10, so 30% of those that tolerated it. So higher dosing was more effective. And a systematic review of milk oral immunotherapy has shown that it is successful in inducing desensitization, not tolerance, but in particular for children who are not able to tolerate 75 mils of milk at baseline, you can see that they are more likely to tolerate the standard dose, which is about 200 mils. 
What about quality of life? So this was a study that looked at 30 children with cow's milk protein allergy that had had oral immunotherapy, and they assessed quality of life before and two months after oral immunotherapy. They found an improvement uh, for the parent and the child over four years of age for emotional impact, food anxiety, and dietary limitations. So generally, it was a, a, a very good thing for quality of life. And we know that cow's milk is very important for um, your, your lifestyle, your social um, interactions with people. What about egg? So this is uh, the major study that looked into egg desensitization by Wesley Burks published in 2012 in the New England Journal. They took children from five to 18 years of age um, with confirmed egg allergy, so these are children that had not already grown out of their egg allergy, and then they randomized them to either the active intervention or placebo, and they used two grams of egg powder, which is equivalent to a third of an egg, and they excluded children with anaphylaxis or with asthma. Again, there were some adverse events. So the active uh, group had reactions to 25% of the doses. These were predominantly oral pharyngeal, and there weren't any episodes of anaphylaxis. But again, these children had been selected to not have a more severe phenotype of egg allergy. So these are the results. After 10 months of treatment, 55% of children were able to tolerate 5 grams. That's just about an egg. After 22 months, 75% were able to tolerate about uh, two eggs. So that was actually quite uh, beneficial. And then they looked to see what happened if they stopped eating egg on a regular basis. And this was very disappointing because these children had actually been doing this for almost two years. And just after four to six weeks of exclusion, the rate of tolerance dropped right down from 75 to 28%. So this was seen as uh, evidence that it didn't really work in terms of tolerance induction. However, I would say that it certainly worked for 75% of children in terms of desensitization, being able to tolerate good amounts of egg in their diet. And I would also say that of those that did manage to get to this stage, they were still able to eat egg ad libitum after 30 and 36 months, whereas none of the group that were having placebo were tolerating egg. So that is a benefit for some of the children. This is a study that I always mention because of the uh, issues with reactions during immunotherapy. So in this study, they did raw egg oral immunotherapy, and they took 22 children aged 8 to 12 years, and they tried to do raw egg immunotherapy. But many of these had reactions, and 14% required adrenaline. They were able to liberalize cooked egg in the giant whilst they maintained the dose of raw egg allergy. And what I wanted to show was that there was no significant improvement in total quality of life score, and this was mainly because of the number of severe allergic reactions that they'd had during their immunotherapy. And so the more allergic reactions they had, the less good their quality of life was. So this is something to take into consideration. So peanut, this is um, what everybody is really talking about at the moment. This is where most of the research has happened. One of the landmark studies was done by Catherine and Agnostu in the Cambridge Addenbrookes group, and they are doing most of the peanut desensitization now. So they took 22 children with confirmed peanut allergy, and they did include children with a history of peanut anaphylaxis. They managed to get these children, for the most part, to eat five to seven peanuts daily. And they got up to successful peanut challenge of 12 peanuts or 32 peanuts over six weeks and then 10 months of treatment. So 95% of children managed to increase their threshold dose, uh, and this was uh, generally above 10 times their original uh, threshold dose. So adverse events, predominantly oropharyngeal. There was quite a lot of abdominal pain, more than the 10% that you usually see. There was some rhinoconjunctivitis. 22% had wheeze, but this was not managed with um, adrenaline. It was managed with salbutamol, so it wasn't obviously very severe. And some had nausea and vomiting. What they did find, which was really interesting in this study, was that uh, there were some unexpected allergic reactions during updosing, and they looked at the cofactors that might reduce your threshold. 
So, for example, intercurrent infection or tiredness, and now there is the, the TRACE study that they're doing looking at how these factors can uh, increase your risk of having more severe allergic reactions to foods. That's not yet published, but will be very soon. So the peanut immunotherapy study did show that children uh, improved quality of life after they underwent immunotherapy, but they just did a before and after rather than a between group <coughs> comparison, so it's difficult to tell uh, how uh, impactful that was. So they also looked at what can predict whether you're going to be a responder and succeed during peanut immunotherapy. And they found that in children with lower peanut-specific IgE, so less than 27, they had fewer reactions during updose. And if it was less than 11, they were much more likely to achieve desensitization. They did not find a difference in asthmatics in children that were younger or older, although I must say that they only started from the age of five. If they'd started from the age of two or three, they probably would have found something different. And they didn't find that the threshold of reactivity predicted whether they were going to uh, respond or history of anaphylaxis. So then, naturally, the next question was whether if you stop peanut immunotherapy, what happens? Can you uh, remain tolerant? So this is a study that was done in America, and they actually had quite a low rate of um, peanut desensitization success. So only 62% of children managed to uh, get to the uh, maintenance dose of peanut, desensit uh, peanut um, uh, uh, consumption. And then they were asked to stop eating peanut for a month, and they had another oral food challenge at that time. And only 50% of those that had tolerated the desensitization actually managed this. So again, it's just a proportion, approximately a third of pe people were able to tolerate peanut a month after stopping. So again, they looked at predictors of success and they found that it had a lot to do with the level of peanut IgE. These were the number of people who were included uh, and achieved desensitization. So if you had a specific IgE of less than two kilounits per liter, then you underwent five grams of the sustained unresponsiveness food challenge, which meant that you had avoided peanut for um, four weeks and you still passed your challenge. So essentially, less than two kilounits per liter, you are much more likely to have this sustained unresponsiveness. If you had IgE less than 15, 75% passed the challenge. But if it was more than 15, only 8% passed the challenge. So that fits nicely in some ways with some of the results that were found by the Cambridge group. So generally, in a child who's got a specific IgE to peanut of more than 15, they are much less likely to have sustained unresponsiveness after one month. Then there's another study that looked at younger children. So I mentioned that if they had done the Cambridge study in two to three-year-old children, they might have found that they had a, a more success in their intervention. This was another American study where they looked at 37 children that were up until the age of 36 months. So they needed to have had a recent peanut allergic reaction and positive allergy tests, or peanut specific Ig of more than five kilounits per litre. So they didn't have very strict criteria for inclusion into the study. But they could have a positive OFC, which would be the gold standard. They excluded life-threatening anaphylaxis and uncontrolled asthma. So they did low-dose immunotherapy at 300 milligrams per day, which is the dose of the Artemis study, or A-immune, uh, and they did that for two and a half years, and they did a higher dose as well for two and a half years, and they matched them with 150 peanut allergic controls that were similar for age and severity. So they found quite high rates of desensitization, so five grams of peanut protein at the end of their um, uh, getting up to their maintenance phase was successful. And then after they asked these people to come off peanut for a month, there was actually a very high level of peanut uh, tolerance, 78%. And there was no difference in the high and low dosing groups, which is perhaps one of the reasons why A-immune decided to go for 300 milligrams. And they also increased 90-fold rate, 19-fold rates of higher peanut consumption in this group. So it was very successful in this preschool group of children. Again, if they had lower baseline IgE, it was even more successful. Then there's been quite a lot of media interest in this study. So this was a study that was done in Australia by Mimi Tang's group. 
and they looked at combining probiotics and peanut oral immunotherapy. And the hypothesis was that using the probiotics would induce regulatory phenotype in the gut that would assist with the uh, development of oral tolerance induction. Now, these children were also quite young. You can see that the age was between 1 and 10 years, so part of the benefit of this study may have been because of that. They found a 90% rate of peanut desensitization, which is very high. If we think about some of the others, it was down to 62% in the Vickery's group versus 7% in the, in the placebo. And then they asked these children to come off peanut for two to five weeks, and they also found a very high rate of sustained unresponsiveness of 82%. But the limiting factor in this study was that they didn't separate out the interventions. So we don't know whether it was just that they picked uh, the younger children or that the doses of peanut oral immunotherapy that they used were quite high, so that that's why they had a successful intervention rather than the fact that they added in the probiotics. Then I wanted to just uh, mention um, a very recent study that came out in The Lancet. So this was from the same group in Australia. They took those children that had undergone the uh, PPOIT study, which is basically prebiotics, sorry, probiotics, peanut, and oral immunotherapy. And they followed them up four years later. And this is just something to um, highlight the way that the media misrepresents some of our research. So in The Guardian, it said, peanut allergy cured in majority of children in immunotherapy trial. Um, and in that article, they say, four years later, the majority of children who gained initial tolerance were still eating peanuts as part of their normal diet, and 70% passed a further challenge test to confirm long-term tolerance. And in the actual Lancet um, uh, conclusion, it says PPOIT provides long-lasting clinical be benefit and persistent suppression of the allergic immune response to peanut. So we had a lot of interest in this paper um, a, a few months ago, and we had a, a, a lively debate in our department about this. So one of the things that we always have to do is look at the details of the study, and I just want to draw your attention to the number of, of people that continued on in this four-year study. So initially there were 62 participants that were randomized to either uh, PPOIT or to placebo and then um, 28 were assessed at the end of the parent study. So that's pretty good going. However, after that, when they went to their long-term follow-up, if you look down here, only 12 underwent double-blind placebo control food challenge. And of these, seven did tolerate the dose. But actually, if you think about it, it's only seven out of 31. So it's certainly not 70%. So again, it's always important to um, go through the details of the papers and often the media and sometimes um, the authors can um, increase the, uh, the, the, uh, the importance of their findings. So what about sublingual immunotherapy? I mentioned that it's not as efficacious as oral immunotherapy, but it is very safe. You have fewer um, allergic reactions, and they have done um, several multi-center studies, but this is just one, where they looked at sublingual immunotherapy for peanut allergy in 12 to 37-year-olds. They had um, two to 10 peanuts per day versus controls. However, after 10 months, none of them passed the five gram challenge, and at 16 months, only 25% tolerated five grams. So generally, it wasn't very effective, although if you're looking for um, just a, a mild increase in your level of threshold, you can say that 70% tolerate it 10 times more peanut. And as I said, it was generally safe. However, there was one parent, a patient, who required an adrenaline auto-injector at home for cough and urticaria. What about epicutaneous desensitization? There's a lot of interest in this. So DBV has created this patch. Uh, and essentially what happens is that the food inside the patch is put onto intact skin and then through the sweat it gets um, permeabilized into the skin and gets taken up by the antigen presenting cells in a very sort of um, non-allergic environment. This is in contrast to if you had active eczema, for example. The patch is generally well tolerated. You can have mild cutaneous symptoms but no systemic allergic reactions generally are reported and no worsening asthma control. And there's been a few studies now which have looked at this. So the VIPE study um, looked at 221 peanut allergic adults, adolescents, and children, and they gave them different doses of the epicutaneous immunotherapy, or placebo. And they looked at what we defined, they defined as treatment responders after 12 months. And this is generally a tenfold increase in their threshold dose. 
So this is a much lower bar than we use for oral immunotherapy. So 53% of um, the individuals in this study were, a were able to increase their um, fold increase by um, tenfold if they had the higher dose of epicutaneous immunotherapy, the 250 milligrams. It, was not, it didn't work in adults um, or adolescents. It only really worked in children. And it didn't work at lower doses. So they continued for 24 months, and actually they managed to increase from 53% to 70% after 24 months. So again, the longer you use this medicine or this treatment, the more effective it is. Now, there are two other studies which they are looking at for the epicutaneous immunotherapy, both the PEPITE study and the REALIZE study, and these results are still pending. Once this happens, they will get, they will get FDA approval, and we may find that um, people start to use this because it is safe, it can be done in outpatients rather than having to be done in a day case. Then multiple allergen oral immunotherapy, this is being done by Carrie Nadeau's group in America. Again, this is a study looking at uh, children and adults between the ages of 4 and 46 years. They did a baseline double-blind placebo-controlled food challenge, and then they decided to do um, either peanut oral immunotherapy or peanut oral immunotherapy and other foods, which included tree nuts, sesame, cow's milk, or egg. They found reaction rates of 3 to 4% per dose, both in the multiple OIT and single OIT, and they were mostly mild, although two required adrenaline. And this is just um, what I wanted to show you in terms of the time it takes to get up to all of these different foods. So the time that it took up to get to tenfold increase from the original reaction, you can see here on the... Um, y-axis, the percentage of subjects having a reaction dose, and this is the time in months. So you can see here that for multiple oral immunotherapy, obviously it takes longer than for single oral immunotherapy, but if you get to this level here where it's a time to 4,000 milligram dose, which would be the standard dose, you're getting up to 16 months and 12 months. So it takes quite a long time to go through all of these interventions, so you need to have very committed family. What about quality of life? They used the um, parental burden quality of life questionnaire, and they did find that multiple OIT had an improvement in the caregiver health-related quality of life. So what are the things that impact on whether you're going to have a good quality of life following OIT or not? <clears throat> in this study, the parents of children older than 10 years had an improved quality of life, and if you were desensitized to more than four foods, you had a good quality of life. And this is probably because of um, the fact that it then helps you to eat out more and not restrict your diet as much. Those uh, children that had pre-existing asthma or if they had lots of allergic reactions with respiratory involvement, they had a less good quality of life. So to summarize, safety of oral immunotherapy is um, reasonably good. During updosing, you mostly get cutaneous symptoms, oral and GI symptoms, but you can get anaphylaxis in between 10 and 20% of patients. And if you have asthma, then you can have lower respiratory symptoms. In the maintenance phase, what we worry about is people having reactions at home, so people need to be informed about cofactors and given practical information. If you do undergo OIT, you have to really restrict various things like exercise after you take your dose. And we do know that compliance with any intervention like asthma inhalers can be very poor, and so we do worry about adherence to immunotherapy, particularly in teenagers when they start taking uh, risk-taking behavior. This is just a study which looked at new onset of eosinophilic esophagitis in people who had uh, undergone oral immunotherapy or sublingual immunotherapy to food allergens. And they showed a 2.7% rate of new onset of eosinophilic esophagitis in this systematic review. So people who get abdominal symptoms need to be really carefully assessed and need to think about stopping immunotherapy. So how can we improve the safety with uh, oral immunotherapy? There's various ways. So you can pre-dose with an antihistamine like we do for respiratory immunotherapy. 
You can do gradual updosing, you can do a longer escalation of the maintenance phase, or you can use other adjuncts that improve the safety, like anti-IgE, or first doing sublingual immunotherapy and then oral immunotherapy. Or you can find ways to reduce the allergenicity of the food. So how can you do that? So physical methods like heating, we talked about baked milk and baked egg, obviously if you heat those foods, you can destroy the conformational epitopes. That doesn't generally work um, for nuts, except if you boil peanut, then the ARA H2 and 6 leaches out of the peanut and into the water. So uh, Paul Turner, for example, is doing a peanut immunotherapy study at Imperial using uh, boiled peanuts. So you can use enzymatic treatment, hydrolysis is what they do in cow's milk formulas, and then you destroy not just the conformational epitopes, but also the sequential epitopes. And then there are some peptide studies which have been shown to induce T-cell unresponsiveness without mast cell degranulation. So you basically get the benefits of downregulating the T-cells without getting all of the side effects of your mast cells degranulating. Then there are other chemical, biological, and fermentation methods. So anti-IgE has been looked at specifically with peanut oral immunotherapy and milk and it has been shown to reduce the side effects, means that you could start at a higher dose, you can get through it quicker, and you can use this in more high-risk patients. But unfortunately, it didn't show any increased efficacy. So, coming down to practically what we, we should be doing. What do the guidelines say? So, in 2014, there were a whole string of guidelines that said OIT is not yet ready for clinical use due to inadequate evidence for therapeutic benefit over risks of therapy. However, things have now changed. So the IACI guidelines uh, are still in draft form, but they were presented at the Pediatric Allergy and Asthma meeting in London just recently. And they are now making very strong recommendations. So they're saying oral immunotherapy is recommended to increase threshold of reaction while on treatment in children with persistent cow's milk and hen's egg allergy and peanut allergy. So the things to highlight is that they're stating that this is to increase the threshold of reaction, this is not to cure their allergy, and this is in children with persistent cow's milk and hen's egg allergy. So this is not in your two and three year olds with a bit of cow's milk and egg allergy. It's more those that are going to have long-term cow's milk and egg allergy because you might grow out of it. This is based on grade A recommendation, so strong recommendation. Then uh, they also talk about OIT may be recommended to increase the threshold of reaction to other foods like fish, wheat, and peach. But this is a grade B recommendation. And they even say that OIT may be recommended to achieve both post discontinuation effectiveness in children with peanut and egg allergy, but not milk. And this is a recommendation grade A or B and it's not recommended in adults at the moment. So there's been a real shift in the culture towards oral immunotherapy. I think that Europe is, has always been quite pro-oral immunotherapy. They didn't um, have the setbacks that uh, we had in the UK with deaths from subcutaneous immunotherapy to uh, foods in the same way. And so it, it's interesting that they are really pushing this forward and most centers in, in Europe, in Germany, in Spain, and Portugal, and Italy are already doing desensitization. So to summarize, so oral immunotherapy can be effective in desensitization, 60 to 85 percent of people who do this uh, treatment will be desensitized. It does seem to improve with, with probiotics up to 90 percent, but as I mentioned, there are limitations to that study. Oral immunotherapy seems to be more effective than sublingual immunotherapy and epicutaneous immunotherapy. And then the question about sustained unresponsiveness, that's in a fraction of patients, so generally somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, unless you're young or unless you've had a probiotics. And it generally does improve your quality of life. It depends on how many foods you can eat and how many severe allergic reactions you've had going through the process. So when you think about, in your service, if you were to start to think about which patients would benefit from this, I think the IACI guidelines make it quite clear in terms of the age. They say between four to five years of age onwards. Severity, so there's the, the, the double bind. So the most severe patients would probably benefit most from it, but they may have more severe allergic reactions. 
It would be good to have biomarkers to see who's going to develop eosinophilic esophagitis or not respond, the 10% that generally don't get to the desensitization phase. Which dose and route of administration? I think that probably oral immunotherapy is the most efficacious, but epicutaneous immunotherapy may be the one that's the most safe and gets used in outpatients. How frequent and for how long? Generally, this is going to be lifelong until we find something else. There's some talk about dupilumab being combined with peanut oral immunotherapy. Potentially, that could induce better sustained unresponsiveness. So adverse effects during updosing and maintenance are very important to discuss with the family. Compliance, again, only very motivated families can do this. And if we're going to be thinking about ways to make this more successful and more effective, we need to think about immune modulators. So, is immunotherapy for food allergy ready for clinical practice? Um, so the safest and most efficacious route and clinical protocol needs to be established. There's some discussion about, you know, is it better to use the food? Is it better to use a medicine? Are people going to be more compliant if they think it's a medicine? Or is it just easier to use a food? So the A-immune study is using uh, a medicine type thing, so little tablets and sachets, whereas in, um, in Cambridge, for example, they had been using just peanut, but now I believe that they're using a more medical approach as well. Biomarkers for success, non-responders and safety, these are important and that there's, we have some information, especially with regards to the level of IgE, uh, but it would be nice to know how to predict gastrointestinal symptoms. So if we're going to be thinking about setting this up in our service, when I think about what's required for research for this, you require lots of dietitians, lots of nurses, lots of day case space, and we need to be sure that doing it is done in a safe way. The patients that do this need to be incredibly motivated because it might be fine for the first few months, but then they have to consider what you know, doing this for the rest of their life is like. And then the cost and resources for the NHS um, are also incredibly important to consider. So obviously at the moment it's not being remunerated by the NHS or NHS England. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.